What's up, everybody? It's the Brown Water Banter Podcast. I am Jared Seymour. I'm Joey Cates. <laughs> and we have uh, Superintendent of Gaucher Pascagoula Schools. I hope I said that right. Uh, Coach Wayne Rudolphich. Yep. How you doing, guys? Good to see y'all. Hello, Coach. We're doing well, man. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for uh, taking the time out to jump on here with us on this Zoom uh, program and talk to us. Um, a lot going on right now in education, for sure. Uh, with with this whole COVID nineteen pandemic, um, we've been wanting to have you on the show for a while, but obviously this is going to change kind of the dynamic of what we talk about. But uh, let, let's jump right into it, man. How how are you as a superintendent of education handling something that is absolutely unprecedented for for you know modern times? Well, one of the benefits I have is I actually went through Katrina. I've been superintendent of the Pascal Goche School District for thirty days, twenty nine days, whenever Katrina hit. So I kind of had a crash course and everything. And I think the thing that most people aren't thinking about now is going to be the mental health uh, as it results from families being out of work, uh, you know, potentially people losing homes, losing vehicles, uh, not having anywhere to put their children while they're trying to go to work. Uh, yeah. So there's going to be some issues that are going to arise and we're trying to develop a very good plan for that. And I think we've developed a good plan for it and have those resources available. But it's going to be something that evolves because this is a totally different scenario than what we dealt with in Katrina. Katrina was physical de de devastation. This is like an economic devastation that we're going to face. Uh, so, and we're going to have to all rise from it. But I think the Katrina uh, event has helped us to be better prepared for this event that we're dealing with today. I agree with that for sure. Uh, like you yep. said, too, this is different in the sense that it's not quite as visible as far as hurricanes have you know damage destruction in neighborhoods this is a little bit more abstract of a thing going on right yeah and you know the, it has exposed a few things over the years i've written multiple articles and given speeches uh gave a speech at the mass convention in 2012 telling people the technology train was coming and i highlighted some of the things we needed to be adapting to and my district has been adapting to a lot of those things over the years increased bandwidth, better hardware infrastructure, electrical infrastructure, all those aspects of the 21st century learning environment. And then uh, whenever BP happened, I put an article out talking about how we should use the BP money to make a bandwidth-free corridor so that you have this accessibility in the event that anything comes up. And I think it expands your commerce by the number of people that you're giving access to because they've now become customers uh, of some kind and somewhere in the commerce field. So I I wish that would have occurred. We're, we've, I think in Pascal and Goche, we've achieved that. We have the capability. We have about 15% of our people that still aren't currently having access to the technology that they need to have access to. You, you see where it was headed even prior to all this. And I've, I've mentioned it a few times already. If anything positive can come out of this, which even like Katrina, right? We had some positive things that happened. Hopefully that people will pay a little bit more attention to what you were talking about there, right? Well, the big thing is that we view this as an opportunity, and I know it's right now it's devastating, but look, man, we can bash whoever made what decision on whatever day until you've actually stood in their shoes. It's very difficult to go out there and really hammer our governor, our president, uh, and, and I mean, you can do it, but it doesn't solve your problem. So the best thing to do is bring people together, smart people, find solutions, talk it out, and fix it. Uh, not No negative statement has ever cured the issue and I, I just think we have to keep moving in a positive direction with all this I agree Absolutely. With that. armchair quarterback that ain't that ain't helping anybody right so like yeah. if you're going to complain offer up some type of solution right that's right what uh what what real quick because we obviously we went right into the COVID thing and that's a pressing issue at hand but can you give people um that may be seeing you for the first time like your background we refer to you as coach we were talking right before we started recording that's what that's what Joey and I know you from 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 way Absolutely. back in the day like what's your uh, you didn't just show up to education yesterday no right. well, you no know, it's really I got here by accident uh, we were in the seafood industry and I know you guys talk a lot about seafood on your program and. I have to tell you, uh, the other day, I had some snapper in the freezer, and I've been saving it for a special occasion. And so I fried some snapper, and I broiled some snapper, and I actually got my uh, recipe backwards on the broiled snapper because my breadcrumbs and parmesan were supposed to be mixed into my butter, and I didn't do that before. I kind of dumped it all in there. But somehow that snapper found a way, and guys, there's no way to mess up a snapper at my house. Right. My children right. eat every bit of it, and they're very finicky eaters, but we had a really good time having that snapper that a friend had sent to me uh but you know as it relates to 
uh, my background, I was in the seafood industry. I worked in every seafood factory just about on the point. I shoveled shrimp from a very early age. During the same period of time I was playing football, had an opportunity for a scholarship. But if your dad was the manager of a shrimp factory, you never got to go home. So I'd work 70 to 100 hours sometimes, and I'd have to jump the fence at the YMCA so I could get my workouts in at night. And I was very committed to wanting to play college football. And originally was signed as a linebacker with Mississippi Gulf Coast, moved me to running back because I played both positions, ended up leading the team in rushing in 86 for a state championship, went on to Delta State University. And while I was at Delta State, the bottom fell out of the seafood industry. So a casino started. And I had to go to school for real. And so I received three degrees in a four-year period at, or five-year period at Delta State University and uh, pretty much made that my focus. Very fortunate to have great mentors. David Oakes, Termi Land at Pillow Academy, uh, was able to coach Stuart Patrick, who played for Ole Miss as quarterback. Um, so I had a really good uh, introduction to the game of football. Of course, I got to coach with Kim Letard, who is probably one of the greatest athletes in the history of St. Martin sports. I mean, he was. Do anything and he's kind of like my hero forever. And he and I got to be really close. And somewhere in the midst of that, because I'd spent so many years training, I wrote a book called Gut Check Athletic Philosophy. And it's about a hundred page book. It's got three 48 week workouts in it. And uh, I went, I was, a pro, I was a coach for seven years. We won a state championship in powerlifting, two state runner up, three South state championships. Had some really super athletes on our powerlifting team. But uh, that kind of ran its course, and I went over to Pascagoula for an interview with a guy named Hank Bounds, and uh, I actually used my gut check training system to get the job as an assistant principal, and they brought me in basically to manage the hallways. Uh, there had been a, multiple fights the year before. We cut it down to practically no fights the next year uh, and kind of started building my reputation and resume on being an assistant principal and then a principal and then became superintendent. Of course, you know, Hank Bounds was the superintendent of Pasco Goche Schools. He went on to be the state superintendent. Then he went to the IHL commissioner, and then he went to the University of Nebraska. And I was on the phone with Hank today, and we've maintained a great relationship. But I've just been very fortunate with the mentors that I've had going through. And, I, and Joey can tell you, uh, I mean, y'all know the kind of guy I was back in those days. I was a little bit on the wild side. I worked at Gold's Gym as a trainer. I was a bouncer at the Bombay Bicycle Club, so I was a little rough around the edges there. But over time, you kind of learn to rise to the occasion. And that, that's uh, been my, you know, kind of been my story is just being in situations where, you know, I just get to work hard at whatever I do, and I'm successful because of that. No great intelligence or great athleticism or anything like that. It's just the hard work that you learn to do. And yeah. I think that's how you power through a lot of issues. I bet, I bet your students uh, can relate to that, though, right? Because you're not just some guy who – like, you've got some life experience. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, he's been on the block. <laughs> yeah, well, and I mean but, – but, of course, growing up in the rich richness of Biloxi as a child, you know, hanging out at the Fiesta and, the you know, upstairs, downstairs, and all these places and going to Buena Vista and drinking coffee, and you sit around with all these characters growing up, you know, and you read about them years later, and you're like, hey, I used to sit around and hang out with these guys with my dad. And uh, there's just a great culture that we had in Biloxi in those days. That you know, it's not there as strongly as it used to be. Those characters are all gone now. But you, you, graduated, you graduated from St. Martin, though, right, Coach? Yeah, I was a 12-year student at St. Martin. But we called it back then, we called it North Biloxi. And uh, the reason that I graduated from St. Martin is my mother and father had to carry me out of my grandparents' home in Hurricane Camille on their shoulders because they were in four foot of water trying to keep from drowning and uh, ruined everything they had. So they moved to North Biloxi, 25 feet abo above sea level. So they'd never have to encounter that again. But yeah, I, just, you know, the Brill brothers and all that crew, we used to hang out at the Broadwater and play football. So, I mean, I just grew up with those guys down there. Right. Th that's like the North of I-10 I push after uh, Katrina, yeah. right? It, Camille pushed everybody north of the Bay. And if I remember right, uh, hearing my family talk about it, that was considered the country, right? You moved to the country right. at that point. Oh, yeah, Latimer, that's where all the country boys were. Yeah. It's amazing. It wasn't but two miles north of us, but that's where all the country guys were. And there's some great guys in that group, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, even remember, like, people talking back whenever Diaberville was considered the country. You know what I mean? Like, some of my older relatives, like, that was the country because you lived on the north, north side left. of the bay. Yeah, well, you know, the dividing line was uh, kind of the pizza hut down there. And, 
the Iberville and St. Martin never could get together around that Pizza Hut without something going down. That's <laughs> right. The Kmart parking lot. <laughs> yeah. And I just, you know, and across the street, we used to have a little convenience store on Le Moyne Boulevard that got wiped out. That's where all the big fights took place back in those days. And, of course, I never was in, around any of it because I didn't want to get in trouble. But, you know, that's where all that kind of stuff happened. And, you know, all that's gone now. It's a whole new world down there. Yeah, right. com- completely different. Joey, what was the uh, – there was a topic you wanted to cover. Uh, what, what was that? I didn't quite catch that before we started recording. No, I, we're, I'm just talking about uh, what, what is – what. What do you feel on the Tate Reeves uh, next week? He's supposed to be talking uh, Tuesday and giving a, uh, I guess, a, you know, telling all the superintendents what's going to happen next for the rest of this year's school year. Right. Well, we're looking forward to getting the information from the governor. Uh, we believe that uh, he's probably going to cancel school for another length of time. Uh, it's a very short window to get prepared. Now, you know, a lot of people are under the assumption we're not – working but we've been creating packets mental health packets online resources videos i mean you name it we've got it out there uh the children that don't come pick up their work we mail it to them in packets uh, of course we're interfacing online with a lot of students uh, our teachers have done a phenomenal job they've created over 600 instructional videos as a result of this that we put online so parents don't have to struggle at home they can just go to that concept say you want to work polynomial you just go there and there's like a one to five minute lesson on here's how you do polynomials. A lot like some of the platforms that are already out there. The difference is it's filtered through our network so we can protect kids from what they see uh, using our network. Right. Yeah. If y'all going like Google Classroom or Zoom. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We're one of the top training platforms in the state of Mississippi. We actually have videos of how to use Google Classroom on our website and other districts. I've invited mm-hmm. all those folks to use our platform for that and for the mental health aspect. So we've been very proactive in trying to help other districts around Mississippi. All right. Yeah, yeah he's got I, something. I mean, if you got, you got a shelter in place till the 20th, right? Now, I think our start date is supposed to go back to 17th or something like that. So something's, something's not adding up. Yeah, I, but I, I think that here, here's the thing that you have to look at. How is a parent going to respond to that order to go back to school? Are you going to send your children back to school with an all clear whenever you're not confident because of what you're dealing with, it's something you can't see or touch. You know, is my child safe going back to school? Right. And I think parents are going to need a little bit more reassurance that this virus is not as active as it is right now. And I think even with that happening, you're still going to have parents that are going to be reluctant to send their children back to school. Yeah. And our spring break, I work at Harrison County schools. Our spring break is supposed to be good Friday, this Friday, and then spring break next week. Is that the same way y'all's falls? Ours actually came before. We're, we're on our spring break right now, and we go back on Tuesday. We'll, we'll accelerate all of our learning platforms again on Tuesday. Uh, you know, and again, you know working in this field, if you're doing it right, what we're requiring of teachers is a whole lot of phone calls. And, and I'll give you an example. Uh, we made, I think, 19,000 calls on school status, which is a documented platform, in, or 16,000 in one day. Uh, during the course of eight days, we served 57,000 meals on grab and go and through our transportation. Uh, and again, teachers created 600 videos, you know, three to 400 of those are online. Uh, so we've got a whole lot of work that we're doing. And it's really been seven days a week for us to make sure we get everything out to our people. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I it's a whole think- different way of life for sure. Yeah, I don't think uh, anyone... I mean, people already appreciate teachers for what they do, but I got a funny feeling that a lot of parents are really going to appreciate it after this is all over with, with having the kids and doing homeschool and seeing what that's really like. Don't, would you agree with that? Yeah, you know, you know we, we've heard about this virtual platform for so long, and I think what people don't realize is there's an equity issue there whenever you're dealing with students in special education, when you're dealing with English language students, that if you can't provide the necessary accommodations, then it creates an unlevel playing field for the students that are there or for students who may not have access to bandwidth. So before you can create this virtual environment, you actually have to have the platform available for everybody to use. And I was talking to Charlie Oaks today from Sparklight over in Pascagoula. He's a regional manager for this area. 
and he and I were just talking about this conundrum that we're all in as it relates to having the bandwidth necessary uh, to be able to project all this information out to these homes. And, and but I'll tell you this too: I'm a I'm a career educator. I've been in this business now for 27 years, I believe. My wife was an AP English teacher for 15 years, and we have four children that are under the age of eight, three of whom attend an elementary school here right by my house, Martin Bluff Elementary. And it's difficult for us as career educators to keep our children on task with all these multiple platforms. I mean, you talk Absolutely. about respecting the work that teachers are doing. It's unbelievable uh, what teachers have to do to maintain the attention of a four-year-old, a six-year-old, and an eight-year-old. And at my house, I know because I live with these kids, but they are like magicians when they get them in class. They do everything they're supposed to do. It's yeah. Do it. And when dad asks them to do it, I mean, you can imagine. It's you know, three of my four children are girls, so they really have me under control. Uh, my, my little yeah. boy's not in school yet. I'm gonna uh, say a prayer for you tonight, by the way. Hey, hey, my my wife's living that same dream right now. She's take she's an educator herself, and she's taking over the role of teacher mom, and she can teach high school kids all the way up to you know any 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 grade you want. But teaching your own kids is a whole different level. It's a whole different genre of teaching. You know what I'm saying? Well, the other thing you have to think about is, you know, we're, we live in a, two, a two-parent home where my wife is self-employed, but she also works for Mississippi State teaching engineers how to write, and then I work as a superintendent. And when you start thinking about the impact of having children at home and what are you going to do with your kids, because it really kind of freezes your economy whenever you can't get people to work. You know, we've been yeah. very fortunate in the field of education that the governor and the legislature and the Mississippi Department of Education relaxed accountability standards and agreed to pay people. Uh, we have a very, we're in a very fortunate circumstance. For those people that don't have that advantage, that's a high stressor for them, you know, and trying right. to figure out what they're going to do with their children. Uh, so we, and, and I hate for people to think us in the fact that we're a, some type of babysitting service because we're not but we do serve a function outside of the function of teaching children for the that just, And that just got highlighted for sure. <clears throat> well, you, you know? brought that up, Coach. Well, how do you feel about the state testing and the laxing of that? Like the third grade testing, the state testing, well, all that stuff. I actually used research whenever the third grade reading gate came out and was against it. I actually wrote a letter to that effect in the Clarion Ledger. And I talked about the fact that we're giving high stakes tests to third graders and we're in my opinion, at the time, we're undermining our teachers' availability to make decisions about children in their classroom and whether they're ready to be promoted or not. Uh, so that was a major issue for me. Uh, the other platform that I'm really concerned about, and, and I'll tell you, we were a National Blue Ribbon school at Goche High School when I was a principal there. We had 300% pass rates with a 95% pass rate in English. We had three 400 mean scale scores. We were a nationally recognized Blue Ribbon school, one of only four in Mississippi. And when I look at the impact that had on that campus, our ACT scores weren't as good, our AP scores weren't as good. And the other thing was none of those state tests counted for anything right. whenever our kids left school. And the other issue is now they've created the concordance table. So now what happens whenever you create that concordance table? If a child fails a state test, then you're going to have grades inflated in the classroom so that child doesn't have to retake that test again. And that's just a dilemma that people get into. And my thing is, that's the first byproduct of the state testing system. The simplest thing you could do is just have students take the ACT, take the ACT work keys. They're very economical from a time standpoint. They're very objective because they're nationally recognized for scholarship dollars. And I think those two tests could solve a whole lot of problems and create a whole lot more opportunities for teaching at the school level. And then the other aspect of that is, you not only are having, right now you've got an algebra teacher, biology teacher, English two teacher, and U.S. history teacher who are all on the hook for accountability for a high school. Yeah. If you go to the ACT platform and the ACT work keys platform, now you've got your vocational center on the hook. You've got departmentally from the bottom to the top on the hook for responsibility, and it's much more of a team effort to increase that ACT score. And sometimes I wonder where would Mississippi's ACT score be now? Have we started in 2005 focusing on the ACT rather than state testing that we've changed multiple times over the years? Yeah, that, that third grade test, I have a third grader, so that third grade test is a big stressor in my house right now, and it's, it's, it's a lot of pressure to put on a young kid, for sure. Well, I'll tell you how far I go with it, because I, like I've told you guys, I can complain about it, 
but because that's what the law is and that's my responsibility, I go to every third grader's home in my school district every summer and I bring them a book and a literacy packet. And that means 530 home visits where I hand deliver a book to these students and tell their parents. I don't say, hey, you need to read with your kids. Hey, you need to do this. What can we do better as a school district to help you with your child? And then this year, whenever January came around, I told my principals at all my elementary schools, send me in your most difficult children that you're having a struggle with, what they're reading, and I'll go back to their home for a second time. So I made another 120 additional visits to make sure that these parents understood that we're here to help and tell us what we can do to make sure that this child does not fail the third grade because they couldn't pass this reading test. Right. Uh, that, that's what so, I call putting in the work. I mean, you're, uh, yeah. you're definitely doing it. Well, and I think you adjust yourself to whatever you're doing. Back in the old days, and I, and I, you know, I, I, I don't know if you guys have seen any of the videos I've done, but I've done some videos reading to students. I've done some videos on crunches and stuff like that. And the reason I'm doing those videos is because I asked my teachers to do it. And I'm not going to do anything uh, or ask them to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. And you guys know my waistline isn't what it used to be, but it doesn't bother me to get on None of ours do. are. None, none of ours none are. Of, yeah. But I mean, you know, and I like to challenge people. I still challenge my guys. I've got some young assistant principals in the district uh, and uh, coordinators and, you know, they're kind of into weights and all that kind of stuff. And as Joey knows, I'll challenge anybody. Me and Cleet De Niro were going back and forth the other day about chin-ups. You got to uh, well, check them up. I saw yeah. my life. I saw yeah. you doing crunches the other day. Yeah, yeah. I can you still knock a few out. You got to let yeah. them know who's boss every now and then. Put them in check. I like that. Yeah. Well, Coach, uh, you, you brought up the career tech uh, program. Y'all are doing some – that's that's what I'm in, of course, in Harrison County. But y'all are doing amazing stuff over there with, like, Chevron and Ingalls, right? Some of the stuff that y'all have is, is top-notch. Well, one of the things that we've done we, – we, we're part of this Ingalls program. But, of course, any chance I get to jump in on something – you know, Ingalls is kind of the lifeblood of our community and, and across the Gulf Coast. When I was a kid, the most popular guys in our school at St. Martin were the guys in the welding program. Right. Because they were coming out with great jobs. They were going to get a new truck right out of high school. They were building their house. They'd have a trailer. They'd have their land. And, I mean, they're just sharp. And, you know, somewhere along the line, people lost the value in that occupation. Well, we've had Ingalls come in and outfit our center to meet their spec center. And on top of that, we've put in pipe fitting area that's covered. We're putting that on right now. And uh, we've actually got an adult program for students who didn't graduate or who graduated but are working in low-wage jobs. And we're training adults at night who are coming out who are making nothing or making $8 an hour. And these guys are leaving us and making $18 to $22 an hour at English Shipbuilding. So we see an opportunity there to help our economy, to help people that, you know, and a lot of people say, well, why would you take on the responsibility of training these 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds who are unemployed and all that? hey, we're not perfect in what we do, and we may have missed the first time. Maybe we didn't give a good enough product back then. And so my thing is, let's give them a second chance. You know, let's help them. And the funny thing is, I went to one of the classes one night, and I was thanking everybody for being there and, and for taking this opportunity to have an opportunity in life. And I said, if there's anything I can do for any of you, you just let me know. And somebody yelled out, yeah, when we graduate, we want pizza. So I gave him a pizza party, but it's amazing how 30 year olds are like, what do you, what do you want? Oh, we want a pizza, what you can get yeah. done for pizza. So, but we're proud of, we're proud of those guys and, and we're proud to be a part of this movement. Uh, the thing is we're going to have to evolve as educational systems that we're going to pick up more than what we're currently doing. And everybody's going to have to look a little bit more to get these industries uh, with the employees that they need because highly trained workforce is what brings people in. Uh, and you guys know Jackson County, Harrison County, we have a lot of available um, corporate space, and we need to attach that space to corporations and bring them in here and get these big box distributors, retailers, those kind of people moving into our communities. There's plenty of real estate out there. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize y'all were doing that with the retraining of, of older adults. I mean, that to me is just, you never, I don't hear things like that come up in debates when people want to talk about minimum wage debates and all this types of things, like actually getting people into a higher paying job in industries that are, that are short on workers, right? Yeah, it, well, they, they have a need. Right now, I think we've got 300 on the waiting list and we're running full, we were running full capacity before all this happened, but we're even looking at expanding by building another welding lab 
in Goche. So that we'd have two and that would double our output. This is nothing new for us because in the allied health clusters, we actually expanded that program to both schools uh, years ago because we knew there'd be a need for medical uh, technicians and nurses and things like that. Uh, so we expanded that program to both of our campuses so we could double the capacity of students who were able to take it because as Joey knows, there's a limit to how many people are allowed to take each course per course and right. then you get into your one level course two level course and then your we put in an internship for our third year students uh, so that's going to be a pretty cool thing as well and that's across all i mean i think we've got about 18 or 19 courses we offer currently have the highest number offered in the state uh, but we're looking at adding two more because with even with the general uh, welding and work we're doing we're also working on uh, uh, we had the first aviation class in the state, the unmanned aerial systems. We piloted that for the state of Mississippi, and we have cybersecurity as well. Uh, so it's, it's a wide range. But the other thing, you have to connect people to their passion, and then it's not work for any of us. It's the same thing with students. Hey, if you want to be a, you want to run an, a drone system, that's fine, but you got to take these courses to get there. Well, that's, that's right. right. That's student to do it. So we find what you're passionate about, and then we wrap your education around it. I don't know if you had a chance to see the episode we did with Bill from the Harrison County Development Commission, yeah. and, and they're doing a little bit about what you're actually what exactly what you're talking about. They're taking high school students, letting them test drive a career field, go and do an internship. They have to fill out an application, go to an interview. If they, you know, if they meet the requirements, this job hires them, and they pay a minimum wage to go see if they want to be an accountant before they spend fifty thousand dollars to get an accounting degree. So that 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 to me is mind blowing. I love that. Yeah. Well, and I'm, and I'm an example of that, too, because I spent my first two years working on being a business major mm -hmm. and just found no excitement in it at all, even though I've more or less run a $100 million a year business now. Um, but I didn't, it just didn't inspire me, you know, like it did to work with students. Uh, and, and, of course, you learn, you have regrets along the way about what you would have done differently or better. Uh, I wish there was several things I could have taken back in my earlier career. Uh, but I, I had, like I said, I had great mentors. Kim Letart was a great buffer for Wayne. You can't talk to kids that way or, you know, because I, I was pretty high strung in those days. Um, but David Oakes was probably the best mentor for learning what a four hour practice looked like on Thursday before a game. I mean, he was going to hit every detail uh, and he was very good at that. Uh, Termi Land, the first thing he ever taught me was uh, a teacher on their feet is worth 10 in their seat. I made the mistake of sitting down between drills one day at a practice on a break. And he yelled at me and he said, Hey, get over here. I said, yes, sir. He goes, uh, why were you sitting down? I said, well, I'm just a little depressed. My dad's having surgery and you know, there's a lot of things going on back home. And he goes, coach, nobody cares. When you come out here to coach these kids, I need you to focus on coaching kids. I hired you to coach them. I'm sorry about your dad, but right now we're in the coaching moment. And I said, you know what, coach, I'll never sit down again. And I mean, that's just the way it went. Some people would say, well, I'll just forget it. I'll just quit. Well, I couldn't quit because he was right. You know, yeah. sometimes candor is important. And if you go back to, if you want to speak on biblical terms, uh, he who rebukes a man finds favor faster than he who flatters with the tongue. And I used to use that uh, to my detriment. And I've learned a lot about not using it to my detriment uh, because listening is probably the best thing that all of us can learn as a skill. Um, and I'm not setting a great example by your podcast now because I'm doing all the talking. Sorry. Nope, nope, no, nope. That's, doing that's what we needed, man. We talked really enough good. one here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pre I love what you're saying. Uh, uh, kids have to understand what you just said, though, about that, about no one cares. Like, wh what does that mean? Do they not care? No, it means right now you're here to coach these kids, and we Good understand we've got problems and things going on, but step up to the plate. And that, whether you're talking about being a coach on a football team or you're talking about life, man, that, that, that rings true. So I was, I was digging that. Yeah, well, you know, and, and I've had my opportunities in life to see a lot of students that are in single parent situations, uh, children who live in homes that, you know, are impoverished, uh, you know, domestic abuse, children who's had parents who were murdered. Uh, we can go down the line. Yeah. And I watch for the resiliency those students are learning because here's the trick, and you guys know it, you're there, and I am too. Once you walk across that stage in your high school graduation, your mom can't come to school or come to work and straighten things out for you. Uh, yeah. You can't, you're not going to get bailed out. You can't cheat on the exam of holding a job. You know, yeah. so all those lessons you learn up to that point, and, I, and I'll tell you the whole concept of gut check. Gut check was about teaching kids not to quit. You know, when we would drop and do 
you know, 1,200 crunches in 15 minutes, that was more about teaching kids to overcome adversity than it was about teaching them how to exercise. Every, every student in that group, from every, every group I've ever had, mastered that concept. And the reason that they did was they weren't going to give up because they wouldn't give me the satisfaction of giving up. And that's the relationship we built. And we would do that and calf raises and push-ups. And, uh, you know, you move from a weight workout to that workout. The most strenuous workout we did was our body weight workout because it was an attack on your mind. When you were tired, well, we continued to push you to see if you, you wanted to stop. So many times. <laughs> and, and, all these, and all these guys are part of that. But while I watch them in their careers, and, I mean, I've got Richard Crosby. I've got Matthew Cartwright. Um, BJ Quavis, you know, all these guys that work in our district now, they've all been through that. And when I look at them, I know they know when they see me in a struggle, they know where we're going. We're not giving up. And, and it's the same thing for them. They know better than to come to me and tell me they're going to give up on something. And it's remarkable the achievements that those two guys, uh, Bailey and Richard, have had in the field of powerlifting. I mean, those guys have multiple 700 pound squatters on the boys' team, and, and BJ's got multiple state champions on the girls' team. They've never seen that kind of success uh, there. The girls' team's good over there, huh? Oh, yeah, doing yeah, really well. Yeah. Well, and Richard has had multiple 700-pound squatters, you know, and that's like the, the, the unbelievable for a high school student. I thought we have, that when we had three 600-pound squatters that we were really doing something special, you know, and now I look at Richard's bio, and he's got all these 700-pounders on there, and I'm like, that's remarkable. So, yeah. But it's great, to yeah. see, it's great to see young people apply some of what they learn uh, whenever they're, when they're finished. And I think David Oakes taught the same lesson. I think he taught fundamentals were so important to us, uh, and he worked on those fundamentals. And, I, you know, he had some other things that uh, people didn't agree with, but as far as work goes, he was a worker. You know, he put the time that, in. That's got to be the ultimate satisfaction for you, right, seeing kids that you taught and then have them come work for you and have the same – you know, same look at life that you have and, and looking to caring for kids the way you did. Well, the, you know, and the funny thing is I've had multiple people that I have uh, worked out with at Gold's Gym that had their degree but didn't have an education degree. And I've asked them, look, if you'll come be an ISI monitor for me, I'll hire you if you promise you'll get your teaching degree. And I've got about three or four guys that have went that route, got their teaching degree, and now their teacher is making great money and doing really well for themselves. You know, and that's the trade-off because, you know, more than anything else, I want a good role model in those right. positions, people that have integrity. Um, you know, that's the most important thing to me uh, is having those young men come in and have an opportunity. And I know the difference in that hourly wage versus a like, salaried wage for those guys. But here's my big question, Coach. You ever miss coaching? You miss it? You got I to do something. I do. As a matter of fact, I took a trip up to Alabama a few years ago. Uh, and um, – got to spend a half a day with Scott Cochran. And I'm telling you, when he left the Alabama program, I was like, man, for that guy to leave Alabama's program, saving must have really upset him because he was kind of the lifeblood of it. But I'll tell you, in conversations with him, I asked him, I said, look, do you ever change workouts up? How do you shock your guys? What do you do? And he told me Nick Saban is using the same workout that they used at Michigan State. And he goes, well, I execute the workout that I'm told to do for Saban. And I said, that's, you know, interesting because, you know, this guy's got, what, six national championships working yeah. with Saban, one at LSU, five at uh, Alabama. Uh, so, it, you know, or, yeah, it's, I think that's right. But, uh, yeah, I, I miss it. I, you know, and, I'm, and I know this isn't popular to a lot of people. I'm a huge Nick Saban fan. He's Croatian for one thing, so we have something in common. Bill Belichick is Croatian as well. Uh, I love that in the heritage of those two coaches. I can I understand their mindset. I know it's not a popular mindset all the time, but they get good results as a result of their mindset. And I can tell you, you guys, if you want to theoretically speak about philosophy in football, I think Alabama was a much better team before they went to this run and gun stuff they're doing now. Back when they used to just pile it up and run it, control the ball, and dominate people. And uh, I, I don't, I, I expect to see more of that this year. I think they're going to go back to the traditional style that they had before, because uh, it really, in my opinion, hasn't panned out for them. Yeah. So what are you, Bama fan now or LSU? What are you? No, well, my wife is an LSU graduate. So you understand that I'm outnumbered in this house five to one on that argument. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, and, and let me tell you, too, if you want to talk about something inspirational, you know, the story of Joe Burrow 
is an unbelievable story. This guy coming out of high school was ESPN ranked 298, 298 out of 300. His, the school he wanted to go to, Ohio State, didn't want him. So he goes to LSU, and this guy ranked 298, becomes the most prolific quarterback in the history of NCAA football, being ranked 298. So that tells you what experts know about guys with heart. And Absolutely. I thought the most impressive thing about him was the class he showed whenever he received the Heisman Trophy and told those guys, you know, he loved Ohio State, he loved his coaches and his acknowledgement of them because that, that's just class, man. We, we need more of that in this world. Absolutely. For sure. I agree with that. For sure. For sure. Um, coach, real quick, before we wrap things up here, uh, just to kind of bring it back to education just for a bit, is there anything – that you or your teachers need from the public right now that's different than normal? Well, we just need a good line of communication with parents. I know they're getting a lot of calls. Parents are a lot of texts. And I think it's important that they respond to those texts because that contact, you got to understand a high school teacher has about 75 people. They've got a contact within their classes. That elementary teacher has probably got 18 to 21 and, but they're covering five subject areas. So it's very important that they receive feedback whenever they ask for feedback from parents. Okay. Okay. And then uh, this is just my own personal kind of wonder. And I'd like to hear what you have to think about it. Just, I know it's far out, but how do you think this changes next year's school it is, and we kind of touched on that already is, is online stuff going to get its day in the, in the light or how, what do you think there? Well, we're going to continue to work on the online platform. Again, we have to work towards equity on the online platform. That's the number one thing that has to happen first. Uh, you also have to train all your people how to use that platform. Uh, it's very important that they're become, the teachers become proficient in it. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's going to be a lot like Katrina. If you guys remember before Katrina, we would go to school. We would wade to school. Now, if we've got a heavy set of thunderstorms coming through, people are talking about, why aren't you canceling school? And I'm like, cool down. we never yeah. we walked to school in those kind of thunderstorms. Yeah. And, uh, so I think we're going to be ultra sensitive to the whole virus issue until there's mm -hmm. some type of vaccination for it. Uh, and, you know, but, but again, people become fatigued and they have to adapt their lives to the life that we're in now. Uh, and yes, I do believe virtual learning will be part of that platform, but I don't think it in any way replaces a classroom teacher. I agree with yeah. that. I agree with that. Well, Joey, unless you got anything else to, to ask, I mean, or, or coach, if there's anything we haven't touched on that you want to mention before we, before we wrap things up. Well, guys, I just want to tell you how proud I am of you for having this platform for people. I really appreciate the attention that you're giving to the fishing industry. You know, I'm an old oyster guy and shrimp guy, and I'm very much about domestic product. Um, I, I think it's important. I, I was part of an oyster factory with my dad at Viking Seafood, my uncle at Premium Oyster Company. Cool Just Seafood, we built their oyster shop there. Uh, you know, oysters is one of the premium products that we have on the Gulf. We need to make sure we figure out how to fix that situation. And yep. the same thing for domestic shrimp. There, and I know that scientists would argue with me, but there's nothing sweeter than a Gulf shrimp, no matter yep. how you cook it. And there's nothing like I'll go down to the boat still, pull shrimp uh, off the boat, go home, and boil them right there. And that's what we'll, and not only do I not only boil them for myself, I boil them for all my neighbors and bring yeah. them to their house. Uh, because I just love that Gulf seafood. We got to get that Bonnie Carey figured out, man. That's killing us. Yeah. yeah. That's another problem we're facing yeah. right now. Another, yeah, for sure. Well, look, we really appreciate you taking the time out to speak with us. Um, once we get life back to normal a little bit, we'd love to have you back on again in the studio and, and do another round of this. I appreciate it very, very much. And guys, I apologize for getting off topic, but when I see familiar faces, I love reminiscing about good old times. I had some great times with you whenever I was a younger man, and uh, I still reminisce on those times today. Yeah, we did too, Coach. I appreciate it. All right, yep. have a great day. Thank, thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for watching, and thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next one. See you all later.